together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, made us alive together in Christ. Lord, thank you that you are the great redeemer. Thank you that you are welcoming us, receiving us with open arms, regardless of our transgressions, regardless of our fallen nature. We come to you as a child comes to his loving father. We receive your grace, receive your mercy. Amen. And this is a clapping song, so let's clap on the two and four. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his one I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, and like the defeat. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our Lord is the will come, the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus mighty name I believe I believe in the hope of heaven he's preparing a place for me far beyond what hearts imagine ears I've heard or eyes have seen I believe that the day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rose a roaring light. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. that bridge no i'll never be ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ how could i ever walk away from the one who saved my life no i'll never be ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ how could i ever walk away from the one who saved my life and no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. I forgot that it's overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. I got the truth of God. Only for the ones and this and them. 
In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe, I Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Sing verse one. I see the King of Glory. I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. Yeah. I see His love and mercy. I see his love and mercy washing over but all our sin. The people will sing. The people will sing. Jose, 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 Jose. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the house. I see a generation. I see a generation rising up to take the place. With selfless faith, with selfless faith, I see a near revival. So, as we pray, let's see where all God is, where all God is. Jose, Heal my heart and make it clean. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Every day I as I into. It's 
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Jose, Verse one, here I am. Humble by your majesty, covered by your grace, so free. Knowing I'm a sinful man, covered by the blood of the Lamb, and now I found the greatest love of all is mine, since you laid down your life. The greatest sacrifice. Sing majesty, singing majesty. Majesty. Your grace has found me just as I am. And empty-handed, but I'm laughing in your hands. Verse 2, here I am. Here I am. Humbled by the love that you give, forgive and so that I can forgive. In your eyes, I sin, knowing that I'm your desire. Sanctified by glory and fire. Now I've found the greatest love of all is mine. Since you laid down your life, the greatest sacrifice. Sing majesty. Just your grace has found me just as I am. Empty hand, but I'm in your head. Majesty, we're singing now. 
Forever I am changed. Forever I am changed by your love. In the presence of your majesty. In the presence singing just in your grace your grace has found me just as I am empty handed but alive in your head Lord being rich in mercy Lord you show your kindness to us in so many ways Lord, thank you for inviting us into your presence, regardless of our past, regardless of our own works, regardless of our failings. You invite us, and we come knowing that you are rich in mercy and rich in love. So, Lord, receive our thanks, receive our praise this morning. Lord, would you encourage us, would you embolden us? afresh for knowing that we have a loving God who is our Father. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Kim, and the Ian Pastor here at Cleveland KCPC will welcome you to our church today. Just a few announcements. College Bible study every Wednesday at 7 p.m. at uh, STJ on campus. Also, young adults will have their Bible study in Ephesians this Friday night. If you want more information, you can let um, um, our young adult leaders know as well. And Agape will we'll give you announcements through uh, Cacao Chats. And if you want to be, if you're a family, new to our church, you can join our family ministry. You can talk to me or one of our leaders as well. This is very important. The next three Sundays, starting next Sunday from 1.30 to 3, and lunch will be provided. There's going to be a deacon training at, at here from 1.30 to 3 for those who are um, going to be trained for deacons. Also, this is very important. So I guess once a year, we have to make food, serve food, and also clean the food. Okay, so today, uh, I just found this out, but uh, the Gape, uh, uh, a lot of the women have been uh, cooking um, from uh, yesterday and today. But then uh, there's also cleanup for dishwashing. And so we need all young, as many young adults in college, if you want to help out, uh, there's nothing more attractive than a man dish, washing dishes, okay? So if you want to help wash dishes after the, uh, after the food, that would be great, okay? And so please, we need, I know this is a last minute request, but young adults in college, uh, it would be great if you can help out dishwashing in the kitchen. If everyone does it, you know, we can probably finish in, a, in 30 minutes or so, or 40 minutes, okay? That'd be great. Also, um, uh, if, you, uh, if, you want, if you need a ride, college students, we also have a 12-passenger uh, a van that also uh, helps you go back to case. And so if you're, you can sign up for that and the link in, in, in our chat. Also, uh, today we're blessed again. Um, Jeff Massanetti came, back, came on May 5th. But his wife, Emily, is here as well. 30 Hearts is here, and he's, they're going to give a presentation today to kind of um, tell us what the nature, because a lot of you guys were not here. And if you guys were here, it would be good to hear it again. But also, not just the nature of their ministry, but also some, some updates as well and how we can be involved as a church in their ministry in Ethiopia. So, and they're going to be doing it after my sermon. So once again, you'll be blessed by a shorter sermon today. God bless. Okay. At this time, we're going to have a time of offering. We have a time of offering at this time.
Let's pray for the offering. Father, we thank you so much. Every good and perfect gift is from the Father of heavenly lights, and you have blessed this church, and you have blessed churches in America so much, and it's just the heritage that, that we have here in this country. And Father, may we think about the world. May we be uh, continually supporting those who are close to your heart. Uh, and, and so we pray, thank you so much for the opportunity, to, and also it's just a pleasure to, uh, to be cheerful givers for the proclamation of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, if we could all stand up, let's join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence at this time. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may sit down this time. At this time, we're going to have uh, my wife, I mean, Debbie, uh, do the uh, corporate prayer and also the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Not working. Not working. Oh, hello. Okay. Sorry. Let us pray. Psalm 8, 1 through 6. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When we consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which, are, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of us, human beings that you care for us? Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today to worship and praise your name. We pray that today, this morning, you open our hearts, remove the distractions, and allow us to be overwhelmed by you and the great wonders of your love. Lord, we pray for those who are battling with illness. We pray for healing, continual hope, strength, and every spiritual blessing. May we as a church surround them with continual love and prayers. May we pray for our college ministry, that you empower them with conviction, purpose, and calling. We pray for deep friendships and growing community that encourage and spurs each, other, each and one another onto greater faith, strength of character, love, and good deeds. We pray for our young adults and agape members. We pray that you give us a missional calling, that we work as unto the Lord and not as unto men. 
We pray that we use our skills and talents for your greater purpose, challenging the status quo and building countercultural Christ-like cultures in our individual spheres of influence, whether at work or in our homes. We pray for us who are parents. We thank you for our precious children and pray that you give us humility, overflowing grace, wisdom, and unconditional love. And we pray for our church. Would you stir up a revival in our midst, a deep passion for your kingdom work, and love to reach both within and beyond our community. May you unify us in love and purpose. We pray you raise up leaders and mobilize intergenerational discipleship so that we can be a church full of men and women fully alive. And we pray for special blessing on the Manzanetti's today and the great work of 30 Hearts. We pray for your anointing on their ministry and that we are moved by the special power of children worshiping and to witness how innocent, pure, and simple praise from the hearts of children can overcome the darkness in Ethiopia, Cleveland, and beyond. May you allow each of us to also have the heart of a child, to have the pureness of joy and childlike faith, filled with delight and wonder of how wide, how long, and how deep is your great love for us. May we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I don't think I need to preach now. I think that was, that was really good. Thank you. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 17 to 22. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 17 to 22. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you are slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. This is why I command you to do this. When you're harvesting your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you are slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. This is the word of God. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for this very sobering, very challenging book, the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy and Amos that I'm going to go through. Pray, Father, that you will uh, revive us, you will prick us, you will comfort the, you will comfort the afflicted, but also afflict the comfortable. That, Father, that you have given a vision greater than ourselves, that our eyes will be on you primarily and not on ourselves, and to those you love, which is everyone. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with a question. And I've asked this question before, but what's the boldest thing you ever said to somebody? What's the one statement that took more guts than you knew that you had to make to make a statement to someone? Okay? Um, I ask this because we're about to look at one of the boldest people in all the Bible, Amos. And so I know we just read Deuteronomy. If you can put your finger in the book of Amos, and if you're not sure where that is, it's right before Obadiah. Okay? But Amos probably lived around 750 B.C., and he was a shepherd, and he was not a professional prophet. And he, he's from a small town called Tekoa. It's a little town near Bethlehem in the southern kingdom uh, uh, in Judah. And one day, God tells his man to leave his sheep and proclaim God's word, not to preach where he lived, but to the northern kingdom, Israel, and preach there. And at that time, northern kingdom was very, very rich. Incredible economic prosperity, not known since the days of Solomon, okay? But there was also huge economic inequality. And people in the kingdom who had money were really happy with the way their lives were going. And so Amos is sent to Samaria, which is the capital city of the northern kingdom, Israel. It is the center of wealth, power, and status, kind of like Cleveland, okay? And so Amos goes there and begins to preach, and people wonder what this new prophet is going to say. And so this is actually a brilliant setup. Okay? Um, if you look at Amos 1.3 in your Bible, okay, he's preaching to the northern kingdom. 
And this is what, how he starts out in chapter 1, verse 3. For three sins of Damascus. Damascus is still the capital of Syria. And the Syrians were enemies of Israel. For three sins of Damascus, God says, even for four, I will not turn back my, turn back my wrath. And so whenever God says that, for three sins, even for four, this is a pronouncement of judgment formula. It's a formula. You know how in English we talk about that was the straw that broke the camel's back? This is a Hebrew way of saying this camel is in a full body cast. Do you understand? And so the people have gone too far. And so they hear these words and they know it's bad news for Assyria. And he describes the sin that the Syrians are committing. In verse 3, because the, she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. And so basically what happened was Syria invaded Gilead, and it was barbaric. It was cruel. And so Amos starts this message by announcing that the judgment of God will come upon one of their enemies, Syria, because they were so cruel and violent to uh, people in Israel. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think people in Israel were very happy to hear this? Absolutely. These were their enemies, and they've been very, very cruel to Israel. So they're glad to hear that the judgment of God will come upon their enemies. In verse 6, I don't have time, it's the same formula for the Philistines, for three sins of Gaza, okay? And on and on he goes. Amos says the judgment of God will come upon all the enemies of Israel. It's going to come to Phoenicia. It's going to come to the Edomites the Ammonites, the Moabites, our website, a kind of award-winning parasite. It's going to come through all the sites. He's, going to, he's just pronouncing judgment after judgment after judgment. And every case, he recounts the last straw that pushed God over the edge. And the people are cheering. People are glad. People are clapping. They're, cla they're clapping because they're so happy that their enemies will be judged. But in chapter 2, verse 4, he does a surprising thing. Now he says this. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. And remember, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were, at, were at, and at war. It's almost like a civil war like we had about 160 years ago. He's going after his people, which is very surprising. And the northern kingdom loves this. They're applauding again because they don't get along with them. And so this leads all to chapter 2, verse 6. And this is a moment of great drama. Now, you have some inkling what's going to happen. But you have to remember, they have no clue. They think that God's going to tell them how great they are, how God has blessed them, that how God loves them. But look what he says to the northern kingdom. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four. Now, after he says that, there's crickets chirping. No clapping. Okay? You can hear a pin drop. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. And in verse 7, this is, this is what's happening. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lay, lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And now no one's cheering. Because now it seems like what God is saying is that Israel, the people of God, are now the enemies of God. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's charging Israel with living as though they were God's enemies. So what's the last straw? What's the act that sets God's teeth on edge? It's the way that people who have resources and claim to follow God treat the poor, the oppressed, but the marginalized. I think it's very interesting. He doesn't say that you don't worship enough. He doesn't even say they don't read the scriptures enough. He doesn't say a whole lot of things that you might think he might say to the church. He says it's the way that people who have resources and claim to follow God and love God and trust God don't help out those who are oppressed. Now, this is very important and, uh, and why this book is more relevant than other because this troubles God deeply. In Deuteronomy 24 that I read about five minutes ago, What's happening is Deuteronomy is basically Moses telling the people of Israel, you used to be slaves. Remember that. And God's going to create a new kind of community. And he expects his community to live differently, to look differently. 
And over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy, there are three groups specifically that keeps getting repeated over and over again. First, aliens. These are people that have emigrated in. They were not ethnic Israelites. Second group, the fatherless. These are orphans. They had no one to look out over them. The third category is the widows, those without power, those that had no economic clout. He says, watch out for the aliens. Watch out for the fatherless. Watch out for the widows. These, were, these are, in our day, what we call marginalized, right? People who are most likely to be forgotten, mistreated, oppressed, and receiving no justice. But this is so important because we truly understand the heart of God. There are over 36 passages in the Old Testament about this. That God would judge a culture, a society, a church, a nation by the way it treats marginalized people. And God makes it very clear that he is the protector of these vulnerable ones. And that anyone that neglects them, neglects him. It's, it's interesting. Psalm 68, it says this. God is a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. Think about that phrase. Those who are fathers. That protectiveness and that fierce love that you have for your kids is just an echo. It's just a dim reflection how deeply and passionately God is concerned for the people who live at the margins of society. There's a special place in the heart of God for those who are oppressed, who are forgotten, who have no power. And God says that goes at the core of who I am, of what I value. That's the kind of God we serve. And I believe this is a very serious implication to for all of us, and I want to explain as clear as I can in the next 10 minutes or so, that God's people are to have a heart like God's heart. And one more statement is from the uh, book of uh, 1 John and also to Matthew as well. It says this. It's a very sobering statement. If any of you has material possessions, m possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in you? And he says at the end of time, God, Christ the King, will separate people, the human race, up to two categories, the sheep and the goats. And this is a very sobering statement. And he says this, those who are in judgment, depart from me, you who are cursed. And they'll say, Lord, didn't we serve you? And this is what Christ will say. Whatever you did not do for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you didn't do for me. So the, from the beginning of scripture, the Bible says the heart of God, yours and mine, will, will be revealed by what we do or do not do for the least of this. Now listen, a little caveat here. There's nothing wrong with being rich. We know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Daniel, they were very rich. They had thousands of sheep, okay? Some of you had thousands of cars, okay? Okay, it's a sign of wealth. There's nothing wrong with that. Abraham fleece, some of you guys lease. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter, okay? What, it doesn't matter how much money it is. Do you still have a heart of God? Matthew says, wherever your heart is, I mean, wherever your treasure is, there your heart is as well. Okay, what do you truly treasure? Do you know, God is not anti-rich. God is anti-love. Anti Those who are, and these things keep you from loving God and people. And he uses every tool he can to wake people up from complacency. I said earlier, a, a, a pastor, a good pastor comforts the afflicted. Comforts that he also afflicts the comfortable. Many of you guys do not like this because you think it's offensive. Good. That's my job. I want you to be offended. Okay? And so in Amos 4.1, he says this. To, can you just imagine someone saying this to people in power? Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, the president of the United States. This is what he says in Amos 4.1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan and Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. Now, I'm not saying that if, you're, if your wife says to, please, husband, can you bring me a drink? That's sinful. I'm not saying that at all, okay? I'm not saying that at all, okay? These, these are not, these, you know, he's calling out the wives, the wealthy and powerful cows of Bashan, okay? Because they're, they're all about money. They're all about power and men as well. You think you're complimented by this? If someone calls you a cow, do you respond by, oh, thank you so much? Do, do any guys say, what's up, cow? You, my favorite cow, moo moo, my hashtag, big cow, holy cow. Listen, Bashan was a very fertile area. They were famous for big cows. 
That's why he calls them cows of Bashan. It's very inappropriate. But this is in the Bible. You cows of Bashan. You, you understand? This is not just name calling here. I mean, think about a moment the nature of a cow. Cows are not notable for their good works. Are they? What are they good for besides helping out with our ozone layer? You know, sometimes dogs, like St. Bernard's, they save people. They rescue people. You old timers, do you remember Lassie? Remember Lassie? Lassie was saving Timmy's life all the time. Even that donkey from Shrek, he's useful. He makes us laugh. Isn't there a certain panda that knows, uh, whose dad makes good noodle soup or knows martial arts that makes us laugh as well? But cows, there's nothing good about a cow except to eat them. A cow is a walking appetite. That's all a cow is. A cow, as I mentioned this before, a cow only thinks of two things. Eat more chicken, okay, and where can I get more? That's all they think about. That's the only question a cow ever asks. You, you, we laugh at cows, but aren't we the same way? Don't we live in a society that very often encourages us to live like that? We're walking appetites for money, for food, for pleasure. If you don't believe me, look at Instagram, what everyone posts. Okay? How can I get a bigger house? How can I get a larger income? There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's your God, there's something wrong with that. And that's the kind of person our society produces, cows of Bashan. And the deeper problem is that these Christians make no connection between their treatment of the poor and their relationship with the God who cares so much about the poor. But they still worship. They still sacrifice. Okay? But they're under the illusion that because their lives are going so well, God is blessing them. God must be pleased with them. But in Amos 5.21, he says this. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And it's one of the greatest verses of all time, Amos 5.24. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. And I think so many Christians fail to make this connection between their treatment of the poor and their relationship with God. And that reveals their spiritual bankruptcy. You know, it's real tempting to evade God's word on this issue. We have an endless capacity for self-delusion. We live in a world that says, you know, you got what's true to you, and I've got what's true to me. But God says, no, 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 no. I will measure my people by the one standard that counts. And it's a very simple standard. Are there hunger people? Feed them. Are there sick people? Visit them. Are there oppressed people? Stick up for them. You know, I was thinking this week, getting ready for the sermon, what if we did what Amos called us to do? Some of you guys are like, I'm on one in person. The need is so vast. I can't really make a difference. Okay? But that's not really the issue. Because you never know what God and you, you can do together. And what matters, you got to try. You never know the difference that one human being can make. You never know. One man, a shepherd from Tokoa, says, go and he goes. And almost 3,000 years later, the world is still shaped and all by his words, by his bonus. You never know the difference that one person can make. I'm sorry for elevating them. The Mancinetti's, trust me, 10, 15 years ago, if, they, if I asked them, okay, first, um, would, you have, would you ever go to Ethiopia? They would say, no way, you crazy. Would they, if I said, you going to have four kids? Okay, maybe, maybe a little crazy. Okay? And but God gave them this impossible dream. Whenever God gives you impossible dreams, it's always possible. Okay? His dreams are always impossible. Unless you forget, Jesus himself was homeless. Jesus himself was a foreigner. Was always considered an outsider. Remember, Jesus' mother was a widow. Remember, he was born in a feeding trough. And God has charged Christians that we cannot be passive about hunger, unrighteousness, the oppressed, the needy. Passivity is not an option. And remember that great quote that many of you guys know by Edward Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I challenge our church. God has blessed us. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. Even you poor college kids, you're so blessed, okay? And so I just want to encourage you and challenge you um, to continue. And that's why we invite people from Building Hope in the City and 30 Hearts and Compassion International and, and Crew. And, 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 and so I hope God gives you a heart. But don't do it out of compulsion. Don't do it out of guilt. God loves a cheerful giver. 
And I hope we can partner up with so many different organizations, missionaries that do great work around the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. You're a great God, Lord. Thank you so much for giving this church a vision. You have blessed us so much, and we love that. We love your blessings. Give us a double portion. But Lord, I pray we will be conduits. We will be dispensers of your justice, dispensers of your love, dispensers of your resources, so that we can bless up the world. We thank you and praise you. I pray that you speak through Jeff and Emily at this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to let's give a hand to Jeff and Emily as they talk about 30 hearts. Okay. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us. It's really good to be back. Um, I was so encouraged last time I was here because so many of you came to the table and bought coffee and asked questions. And I just loved uh, seeing your your compassion. And um, so we're excited to share again today. I'm, I'm glad that now my wife, Emily, is uh, with me because this is a story that started with her so many years ago. So I'm going to let her uh, start it off. All right. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us to be here again. I'm glad I can be here. So yeah, our story starts with a little girl named Wayana too. So she lived in Ethiopia. She lives in Ethiopia and we had been supporting her and decided to visit her. And we were able to see, this was back in 2011, um, her home where she lived, she lived with her aunt. She had been orphaned at the age of five. Her parents passed away and our support for her truly was changing her life and learning that from her and then seeing where she lived, her small home, we were impacted and our hearts were changed even more. And so um, that 2011 trip opened up so much. It started all of this, um, long story short, and God just brought us from one thing to the next because of that. But thankfully we're still able to keep in contact with her. She is grown, she is doing really well, and we still have visited her many times in Ethiopia. So God has brought her story to where it is. And so <clears throat> we're excited now to take that and just keep it going in Ethiopia, Lord willing. And so the next slide shows um, a few years ago when we saw Wayne too. So yeah, she's doing well. So because of Wainatu's story, we realized there are many, many, many children who were like her, but didn't have the opportunities that she had. And so the next slide, you'll see there's just as we've drove, drove around, just different trips that we've taken to Ethiopia, there are kids who aren't like her, who didn't have a safety net, who didn't have an aunt or someone to take care of them or support from people like us. And they are on the side of the road collecting water um, from the little stream that's dirty. It's di just dirty water, collecting it in a jerry can to take it home to hopefully boil for food or unfortunately drink. Um, but that's what they're doing. That's That's how they're hoping to survive. So kids are on the streets. And there's many reasons for that. Um, the next slide, you'll see there are little kids early in the morning working. This is their job to collect um, things to sell, to collect things for firewood, um, stuff that kids shouldn't be doing. They should be in school. They should be playing. And so many reasons, um, poverty is the umbrella. But so many reasons fall under that of why children end up on the streets and why they are um, orphaned or abandoned, whether their parents pass away from illness and disease or their parents can't take care of them. They don't have the resources. And so them finding their own resources maybe is the only option. Their parents might have a mental illness. Um, other reasons are just the lack of income for those parents. They don't have the opportunity to hold a job or to get a job. And so their kids have to help with that. They can't go to school because they have to work also to bring in an extra income. And so all of this culminates into so many children, especially Ethiopia, who have just so little or lack of their basic needs. They don't have what they need. So the next slide, we'll see a a boy, just a beautiful boy, but I would 
I would guess that he's been wearing those same clothes all year long. Um, we've heard from stories of the kids in 30 hearts who are doing well now tell their story about back then and how they'd wear the same pair of clothes all year. It's all they had. They're ripped, they're torn, they're tattered. And it's kind of that picture you see when it comes across a commercial or you see it on an ad on Facebook where, oh, that poor kid. And, oh, I don't know, what should I do? But I mean, we, this, this kid we met, we, they're real and they're, they're suffering and they're in a place that they shouldn't be as kids. And so because of all of that, because of learning and meeting and seeing the need in Ethiopia, we realized we had to do something, but we didn't know what to do. Um, we definitely didn't think we were going to do anything that big or grand. We just wanted to help kids who didn't have parents. And so as God does, he answered the prayers of our hearts and he led us to a man named Miss Ghana in the next picture. This is Miss Ghana who runs a nonprofit in Ethiopia who we partner with. And he is an incredible man of God who is so faithful and so um, just so full of the Holy Spirit that he is willing and ready to do whatever it takes to help the kids in his country of Ethiopia. And so meeting him and coming up with this plan has really what God has used to make 30 hearts what it is. And the next slide is a video. You'll hear more from him and his story. I have four children. I can't send my children to school. But I have thousands of even millions of children on the street of Ethiopia. Those have no child at home. Those have no food. Those have no clothes. Those have no chance to attend their school. They are suffering. I would like to please my American brothers and sisters and the and the churches and the other companies, if it is possible for them to start with this video, with such a project. So stand with us, praying for these children, for the Ethiopian children. Let us rescue, if it is possible, these children. So we started talking with Ms. Ghana about ways to rescue these children, these children who are on the streets, who had um, no parents and, and ways that we could provide for them. And uh, to go and partner with his organization, SVO, it means Stand for Vulnerable Organization. So they are the partner of 30 Hearts in Ethiopia. Um, so I went with my friend Joe uh, to go and meet Ms. Ghana and see their different projects and how they work. And we went to a town called Baco that was a rural uh, city out west, and it was far from the capital, so it was hard for people to get back and receive the health care that they need. And um, it was hard for them to find work and to be able to provide for their families. And this was a trading center, so there is a lot of traffic. So a lot of children ended up in the town of Baco trying to find shelter, trying to find food. And so Miskana um, took us to the government office one day, and we met some of these children who they were trying to find guardians for. They were trying to find, um, some of them had temporary guardians. They were trying to figure out how they could help some of these kids, and they just didn't have the resources. They just, there's no safety net there in Ethiopia like we have here for some of these kids. And there was uh, one boy we met in particular, I think I shared about him last time. Uh, his name's Abasa. And they explained to us that Abasa was on the street for about a month and he was only four years old. And we held this boy and um, just looked in his eyes and just had this, this uh, conviction that we can't, we, we have to go back. We have to do something. And so that's uh, why and how we started 30 hearts. We came up with the plan looking at Abasa saying he belongs in a family. He belongs in a place where he's not just in a home and, and he's fed, even though that would be great. But we want him to actually grow up having um, having brothers and having um, a mom to care for him. And so we started 30 Hearts in 2015. And in the next picture you can see uh, we named it 30 Hearts because we started with 30 children. And so well, we brought the 30 children that the government and the local churches and SVO, Ms. Ghana's organization, all worked together to identify uh, 30 of the most needy 
orphan children who had lost parents. And <clears throat> they were brought into what we call the new family development home. Um, and they were united with six Christian women from the local churches. And so you can see this is in 2015, a few months after opening, um, we went and visited them and <clears throat> brought them 30 heart shirts. And the next slide, you can see now these children were growing up in a family. Um, so this is Desta with her five girls. And like Emily was saying, all these, uh, these girls, all these kids, they have a story. They all have a background and they, um, they all have experienced some sort of deep poverty and suffering. And now you can see the joy on their faces um, because they have their needs met. Most importantly, they have um, the love of a family and they have the love of Jesus because all these women are, are Christian women and they're able to direct their children to Jesus. And now that you can see in the next picture, Abasa uh, has joy too. He now has a mom. Um, his mom there is Tiranesh and she loves him and, and he has joy. And we're so thankful um, for that. And so we've seen God do a lot of things over the years. One of the, the big things is that he's provided through the government there about two acres of land. So we can see there's this large section of land and the plan was to build homes so that the families could be living in homes and we could build an entire family development center here where we could continue to, to bring kids in and, and help kids grow up here in family settings. And we didn't know what we were going to do because we were new to this whole nonprofit uh, fundraising world. And it was $30,000 for a house. And we wanted to build six of them because they were all just sharing a small rented complex. And it was, it was not an ideal situation. We wanted to use this land. And so, again, like God does through lots of prayer, through lots of people who heard what we were doing and caught the vision he provided. And um, over the next few years, we were able to build all six homes. You can see all six homes there. And so now each family um, had a place to live. And this was a huge step up for so many of these kids, as you can imagine. Now they have running water. A lot of, you know, there's toilets in these houses. It's the first time they've had a toilet, not just a hole in the ground. And so they are um, really grateful and really happy. And then we've even been able to get some grant funding and some larger donations to continue expanding uh, the property there at the Family Development Center. And you can see in the next picture, we've built uh, staff offices and a learning center so that they can, they go to school in the community, but they can be tutored and they can grow in their education so that they can pursue their dreams. And um, we've also built a mini clinic to help the families there, but also the surrounding community who are now starting to reach too. So uh, God's doing a lot of things and we're uh, trying to keep up with the way, <laughs> the way that he's moving and we're just so grateful. Yeah, so the next picture. So when we talk about how we have the kids who have families now and they have a home now, um, it doesn't end there. We in 30 Hearts, we want to make sure that all of the children in the care of these families are provided for holistically. And so the basic needs like having bedding and pillows and blankets and clothes, clean clothes. Um, the next picture they have, like Jeff said, they have running water and bathrooms, which is so important for hygiene and for, they even have classes to teach them proper hygiene and how to take care of themselves and to stay healthy. Things like medical checkups once or twice a year. Um, many of the children who might've had other maybe more serious issues over the years, they've been able to go to a hospital or get further checkouts for them. So that it's really important that these kids are looked at as their whole selves, everything that they need. Um, obviously in the next picture, we make sure they have food. And so they have three meals a day. They have a snack after school, just like our kids would. And that's really important for healthy meals to be fed to them that they can count on, that they can trust that those, that food's going to be there when they need it. Um, the next picture, they can play. Like we, had, I kind of talked about in the beginning, there's kids not playing. They're not going to school because they're working and they're trying to find food or they're begging or scavenging for it. But now these kids can play. They have a playground and they can have fun and they can just enjoy it and be happy. 
They also, in the next picture, you'll see they have a chance um, on the property. There's a lot of land. They've grown their own garden. So each child has their own section that they take care of. And so they've grown their own vegetables. They've eaten them. So it's just learning how to do that skill on top of having healthy food is really great for them. The next picture shows one of the classrooms. So like Jeff said, they go to school in the community. They have a great school they attend. So they get an education and they're given the chance to go to school and finish school and do well in it and just excel. And then their minds are able to dream and think, what, what do I want to do one day? How do I want to use the gifts and the, just the learning that I've had to keep going and, and change their culture and their community. Uh, the next picture shows one of the moms, um, she's praying over her kids. So she and all the other moms, they teach their children how to pray, how to read the Bible. They do Bible studies in the morning and in the evenings. The project coordinator does Bible studies with them, which is the most important part of all of this is they have every need possible met, but the most important need of their hearts is met. They know the love of Jesus. They know they've been created in his image so that they can glorify him in all that they do. In the next picture, this is the same family. Um, so that's 2015 and that's 2021. I think how much those boys have grown. They're taller than their mom now. Um, it's just such a sweet picture to see where God has taken them, where holistic care can take them, where the hope of Jesus can take children from despair and hopelessness to hope and life. And we we're seeing it and it's so encouraging. So the next Slide is a video and it shares some of the children's stories. So, yeah, as, as you can see, there's 
that sums it all up. Um, hearing from them, hearing their own words, uh, how they've been changed, how they've been impacted. It's all God and we can't take the credit for it. He's the one who's using so many people to do extraordinary things in their lives. And the goal, so we started, you can see in the next picture, we started with 30 kids, but the goal was never to just end with 30. It was always to help more. And this year is special because we finally were able to build two more homes and bring in uh, 10 more children. So you can see in the next picture, these are the two new families that were just added earlier this year. And so these are our kids who are just going from uh, life without parents to now life in a family. And uh, we now are at that spot where we kind of took a leap of faith like we did in the beginning, where we're trusting God to provide for these families. We knew that there was a need. He provided uh, the the funds for the homes and we built the homes. And so uh, we knew that the families would would come in. We knew that there were children, but now we do need funding to support these kids needs to support their holistic needs. And so if you're, if, if, if God's tugging on your heart today, and, and this is something that you are feeling led, uh, to partner with, to support, to join us in helping these families, you can come to the table and learn more about how you can support. Uh, what's great is we have, you can see on the next slide, we call it the embrace giving program. What's great about this is you can give uh, $5, you can give $500, but it's monthly commitments so that we can help plan and and know how much uh, we can provide for. So it's, you know, a bunch of supporters working together to meet the needs of these kids. And you can be a part of that. And you can see like that other uh, photo, you can see how they grow over time and how you are providing for their needs and and set them up for a brighter future. And so if that's you, I just, yeah, I just ask that um, you, you could come and uh, take a, a brochure and pray about it, bring it home and think about it some more. Um, but just really ask God, just thinking about Pastor Chase's sermon today, ask God what it is he wants you to do. Because as Christians, we are called to do something, right? And maybe you're not meant to start a nonprofit like we did. Maybe you're meant to pray. Maybe you're meant to tell as many people as you can about it. Maybe you're meant to connect with another organization, or maybe you're meant to support 30 Hearts. Whatever it is, um, I encourage you to take it seriously because there is a great need in the world. And we are here at this time for a specific reason, and we have the ability and the resources to meet those needs. So I encourage you to ask God how you can be a part of that. Um, one last thing, we have a special opportunity coming up this coming weekend, uh, Ms. Ghana is coming to the U.S. So our partner from Ethiopia is, is coming here and we're doing a uh, photo gallery show. So we have a lot of beautiful uh, photographs that we'll be setting up a gallery at Bay Arts in Bay Village, right across from Huntington Beach, if anyone's familiar with that area. So that's Friday night from 6 to 8.30. So we'd encourage you to come out to that and you can meet Ms. Ghana, see some photographs. It's just a fun night out after a long, tiring week. You can go and relax and um, invite all your friends so that they can learn about the mission too. So thank you again for giving us the time. Um, if you would like some coffee, we have same coffee we had last time and a different type of coffee and t-shirts and um, you can just learn some more information. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you're interested in going, come talk to us after. We're always planning trips. Um, we have one next summer that we're planning. So if that's something you're interested in, come and talk to us and we can give you the details about that. I'm happy to fill you in more. So yeah, we love um, you know, seeing everyone interact with the kids and, and encourage them. It shows them that they're not alone, that there are lots of people back here supporting and praying for them. So yeah. <laughs> So you guys are going in November. That's right. Yeah, first week in November. Uh, you don't have to get. You don't have to be a doctor. Right. Or last time. Right. But uh. Right. Mm hmm.
Yeah, definitely. Thanks. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you so much for this time to get together um, as believers to worship you, to um, just focus on you. We're so busy throughout the week and there's so many just distractions and just ask that um, you would help our, our hearts to, to quiet down and to focus on what you're trying to say to us today um, through the, this message, through your word. We thank you for the truth of your word and um, the story that Pastor Che preached on in Amos that just pray that it would be a wake up call to us, that we would realize that we have been blessed and maybe we, we think we're not as blessed as someone else or we're comparing ourselves to someone who has more. But God, help us to see what you've given each of us individually and the ways that we can look around us and and help others. And I just thank you for the way this church is doing that. Thank you for the way that they are um, taking your gospel and your truth and and loving others around them. And I just pray that you continue to fill them up, that you would continue to uh, just set this church on fire so that they would be set apart. They would be different than everyone they interact with would see that uh, there is something holy and special going on. And that would be you. That would be uh, your son, Jesus, that that you would use everyone here to, to point people to you, that when we um, have these acts of love and when we serve and when we give, that it wouldn't be about ourselves. It would be about your glory and how you want to move and work and spread your kingdom. And I just pray that you would do that through this church and through uh, these people. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Now I long to breathe the air of heaven. Pain is gone. Earth fills the street. To look upon one in that same walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when I'll bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died in a again. Only, only is the Verse two. In every prayer, great desperation, the songs of faith we sing to God and fear. And in the end, see that it was worth it. He returns. To wipe away our tears. Oh, there'll be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face when he died again. Only, only is the love. And on that day, and on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside. The hues of the faith with one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain. Sing that again on that day, and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside. The heroes of the day with one voice, a thousand generations. 
sing for thee as the Lamb who was slain. Forever he shall reign. So let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let it be today. We shall be here with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty glory, glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. And holy, holy is the Lord. Families, um, if you let them cut, uh, cut so they can get uh, their kids fed as well. And you can also visit Jeff and Emily as well uh, during uh, lunch or after lunch or before lunch. Let's pray. Now to him who can do immeasurably more than we can possibly ask or imagine, to him be all the glory and honor and praise. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.